On November the 8th, 1656, in a town near London, England, a little boy was born. His name was Edmund Halley. At that very same moment, a comet without a name was rushing silently through space, passing somewhere near the planet Neptune. That comet would not be seen by people on Earth for another 26 years, in 1682, when Edmund Halley, now a brilliant young astronomer and member of the Royal Society, trained his telescope on this comet and determined to unravel its mysteries. That very comet would one day be named after him, Halley's Comet. Oh, hi. I'm Paul Tripp. I've been doing quite a bit of homework on Halley and his miracle in the sky. And I'd like to share what I've learned with you. Halley's close encounter with his comet in 1682 inspired him to dedicate 23 years of his life to the study of its wonders. Like a, oh, like a scientific detective. Edmund Halley searched for the clues that helped him to calculate that this comet was in the habit of revisiting our planet every 75 years or so. Now, many things lead me to believe that the comet that appeared in the year 1531 is the same comet that was described in 1607. It is also the same comet which I myself saw and observed when it returned in 1682. The identity of these comets is confirmed by the fact that in 1456 a comet was seen, and although not observed astronomically, yet from its period and its path, I believe it was the same comet which appeared in the years 1531, 1607, and 1682. I may therefore, with confidence, predict its return in the year 1758. Well, he's got me convinced. Oh, I hope I'm right. I really hope I'm right. This comet could make my name as lasting as a rock. Suppose it doesn't come, then I'll be made a laughing stock. Oh, I hope I'm right. I really hope I'm right. Depending on astronomers I've never met before Who said they saw this comet in the dusty days of yore Suppose they all were careless Never kept their record straight And claimed they saw my comet But could not recall the date, I hope I'm right It really shouldn't matter, I really shouldn't care Cause even if it does return, I surely won't be there If it arrived precisely as I predict it's due I'd have to stay alive until I turned a hundred and two Still, I hope I'm right, I really hope I'm right To be thought of every evening when the stars come out at night Recalled with so mysterious and wonderful a sight To be cheered when Halley's Comet streaks across the sky so bright I know I'm right I don't know why I'm worried, really. Well, we do. We live in an age when scientific miracles happen every day. But Halley lived in an age when astronomy was not an exact science. Astronomers were still arguing about whether the Earth moved around the Sun or the Sun moved around the Earth. By predicting the return of a comet, Halley was going against all the known facts. Did you ever hear of Sir Isaac Newton and his experiments? Ow! The law of gravity. <laughs> no. Well, Newton developed his law of gravity with those experiments which said that all the planets, including Earth, had to move round the sun in orbital paths. The problem was that nobody could prove he was right 
because for the most part astronomers judge things only by what they saw. And Newton's theory was beyond their understanding. But Halley understood more than that. He saw how to use Newton's ideas in his own study of comets. It seemed obvious to most astronomers that comets traveled in straight lines across the sky and then disappeared, never to be seen again. But Halley disagreed. Stuff and nonsense, poppycock! It is perfectly plain to me that comets follow an orbital path, much like the planets do around the sun. With the return of Halley's Comet, <laughs> well, I would be honored if it were so named, when my comet returns in 1758, it will be the very first time in the study of the heavens that a great idea is proven by an awesome event. Then you will see that I am right. <laughs> and so, by the way, is Sir Isaac Newton. This is Edward Tomorrow reporting the news. Dateline, Christmas night, 1758. I am standing with a group of renowned astronomers from all over the world as they anxiously scan the sky for any signs of the return of Halley's Comet. I think I see it. I claim the first sighting of Halley's Comet for France. <laughs> Foolish fellow, that's my scarf flapping in the wind. If anybody sees Halley's Comet first, it'll be an Englishman. Apologies, please. Chinese astronomer have seen this comet for many centuries. Chinaman will see Halley's Comet first. The excitement mounts as the evening sky darkens. It must only be moments now before... Guten Abend, mein friends. For what are you all staring at the sky? Why, we are here to witness a great event, the return of Halley's Comet after an absence of 75 years. The Comet? Oh, the Comet. I just saw it an hour ago. Gentlemen, gentlemen, your telescopes are pointing in the wrong direction. There he is over there. Look, he's a cute little fellow, isn't he? <laughs> and what, sir, is your name? You are the first man to witness the proof of Sir Edmund Halley's and Sir Isaac Newton's theories. Oh, is that what I did? My name is Johann George Palitsch. I'm just a simple German farmer who dabbles in astronomy. <laughs> oh, by the way, you spell that P-A-L-I-T-Z-S-C-H. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, you were there. And you can be there this time. Halley's Comet reappeared as Halley said it would in 1758 and then in 1835 and 1910. And it will make another appearance at the end of 1985. Oh, and of course, in 2061, 2137, uh, 2213, and on and on and on. You see, Halley's Comet comes to visit us about every 75 years. And that means that for anyone lucky enough to see it, it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. It's a once in your lifetime experience. But let's get down to the facts. What will you actually be seeing when you look up in the sky and say, hi, Halley's Comet? Now, a comet has three main parts, the nucleus, the coma, and the tail. As to what these are made of and how they are formed, well, there are a lot of theories, but no one really knows. In Halley's day in the 1600s, science was not advanced enough to study a comet's actual makeup. But by 1910, science had come far enough to attempt a serious study of what a comet actually was. Still, even with the most powerful telescopes available, scientists could not get a close enough look. But scientists being what they are, they took a stab at an educated guess. 
They figured. A comet is a streak of light that spreads across the sky. It isn't very often that they chance to happen by. It seems to be a miracle that makes them look so nice. Would you believe it all starts out with dust and dirt and ice? Well, it's a dirty snowball, a dusty, dirty snowball. A good part of its life is spent looking like a lump. Yes, it's a dirty snowball, like in a city snowball. Why should we get excited over such a dumpy bump? Well, I'll tell ya. A comet isn't much until it starts to near the sun. But as it comes in closer, a phenomenon's begun. This dusty, bumpy, dirty, frumpy, lumpy, solid mass gets partially converted into brightly glowing gas. It's just a dirty snowball. Starts out a dirty snowball. But bring it near the sun and it will change before your eyes. This little dirty snowball becomes a shining global. This most amazing blazing sight will surely hypnotize. Well, now our comet's glowing and it's looking kind of pretty. Considering the way it looked when we began this ditty, this little lump is shedding lots of atoms, small and frail, which brings us to the subject of its most distinctive tale. The sun's light bumps these atoms, now they're charged electrically. And soon we'll learn precisely how long the tail can be. These atoms all are pulled into a great magnetic race. And a comet's tail will stream a million miles out into space. From just a dirty snowball, a tiny dirty snowball, a comet may start tiny, but it sure ends up a cycle. From a dirty snowball that's traveled quite a long haul and given us a miracle of brightly shining light, it has given us a miracle of brightly shining light. Now, in the past, scientists used to bite their nails, wondering whether the comet would keep its prearranged appointment with Earth. This time, however, we don't have to wonder, because we've already seen it. That's right. As far back as 1982, the giant telescope on Mount Palomar in California detected the comet when it was still beyond Saturn over 900 million miles away. Scientists from all over the world have formed an organization for the study of Halley's Comet and call themselves the International Halley Watch. And in 1989, all this new information about Halley's mysterious comet will be published for the whole world to share. For the first time, we will not be limited to viewing Halley's Comet from our own Earth. Now, we have the ability to go up and study the comet in its own environment, outer space. In 1984, the Soviet Union launched two probes to study Venus. At the suggestion of French scientists, these probes had been modified to enable a further study of Halley's Comet in March 1986. The probes will pass within a few thousand miles of the comet's nucleus, sending back television pictures. And then there's Giotto. Now that's the European Space Agency's probe. On the night of March 13, 1986, this spacecraft will race through the comet's atmosphere at speeds approaching 40 miles per second, or over 140,000 miles per hour. And believe it or not, Giotto will pass within only 300 miles of the nucleus 
probably committing suicide in the process. Scientists will only have 10 minutes to retrieve pictures from such a fantastically close range before the probe is blown apart by the crashing storm of cometary dust. Japan will make its first interplanetary space shot with a probe of its own. It's called Planet A. Japan's probe will pass 60,000 miles from Halley's Comet. And while it won't be quite as close as Giotto, it's not bad for a first try, is it? The United States will be making its own contribution to the study of Halley's Comet. Part of that contribution will consist of a team of scientists that will be working closely with their European colleagues on the Giotto project. In addition, a NASA spacecraft orbiting Venus will become an observatory radioing back to Earth pictures of the comet at its most brilliant point. Astronauts aboard our space shuttle will also report back to Earth on their comet watch and mounted on board will be powerful ultraviolet telescopes to send back priceless information. Now that we know what all these countries are doing in this year of Halley's Comet, let's see what the comet itself has been doing since its last visit to Earth. Well, when it left Earth in the spring of 1910, spinning away on its elliptical orbit into the darkest recesses of the solar system, Halley's Comet made a journey of three billion miles which took 38 years before it reached its farthest point from the sun. That's the point that scientists call the aphelion. Halley's Comet reached that point in 1948, oh, way before most of you were born. The comet turned its aphelion and headed back towards us, and on November 27th, 1985, it passes within 58 million miles of us. 58 million miles? Don't worry, we'll be able to see it. But can you imagine how far that is? Let's see. Uh, hmm. Five and five, carry the one. Oh, wow. If you got on a jumbo jet tomorrow morning, you'd have to fly continuously for 11 years to get that far. Next, the comet will circle the sun, making its closest approach to the sun, the point that scientists call the perihelion, on February 9th, 1986. When the comet goes past the Earth again, on April 11th, 1986, it will be putting on its greatest show. Now, actually on its way back to Athelion, the comet will pass only 39 million miles from us. Now, during that brief period that Halley's Comet visits the Earth, you'll want to know exactly where to look up in the sky to see it. Well. That depends on what part of the world you're looking from. Let's take as an example two kids I know named John and Sally. They're both very excited that they're going to see Halley's Comet, but they live thousands of miles apart, and that will affect the way they will view the comet. First, let's visit John, who lives in New York City. That means, of course, that John is in the Northern Hemisphere. He has been making his preparations. I'll need a pair of binoculars or a telescope to help me view Halley's Comet. They don't have to be very powerful, but they will make the comet much easier to see. I told John that viewing the sky from outside the city will be better because there is less glare from city lights. Okay then, I'll ask my parents to take me out into the countryside for my comet watch. All right, let's see what John will be seeing. Starting in early December, 1985, just after sunset, Halley's Comet will be seen as a smudgy disk with a short tail very close 
to the western horizon. During the next couple of months, the comet will steadily grow brighter and brighter, and its tail will grow longer and longer. And as the tail grows longer, here's a very interesting fact for John to remember. The tail of the comet always points away from the sun. That means that after perihelion, when it is moving away from the sun, the comet's tail actually flows ahead of it. You see, in the airless vacuum of space, where there is no wind, the sun sends out streams of particles which act like a wind, blowing past the comet's nucleus and pushing its tail ahead of it as it travels away from the sun. Well, imagine that. On February 6th, 1986, the comet disappears from the night sky as it circles around behind the sun. It reaches perihelion on February 9th and reappears in the dawn sky, just above the eastern horizon on February 24th. I sure hope you're getting all this. Anyway, it continues to appear in the morning sky until early April when it puts on its best and brightest show. That's what John will see. Now Sally, who incidentally is proud that her name rhymes with Hallie, has a much easier time of it. She lives on an Australian sheep farm. Uh, Man. <laughs> And Halley's Comet will be considerably more visible in the skies of the Southern Hemisphere where she is. The Comet will follow much the same schedule in the Southern Hemisphere as in the Northern. But Sally will have one major advantage. While John must carefully search the horizon to see the Comet, Sally has only to look up and there it will be high in the sky. People are often frightened by what they don't understand, and throughout history, they just didn't understand the unpredicted arrival of Halley's Comet. And because of that, any disaster or major event around the time of the comet's return was blamed on it. You want a few examples? Okay. In 373, the Huns attacked the Us. Goths. Strange, but no matter. But uh, blame it on Halley's Comet. In 451, Attila the Hun invaded Gaul. Blame Halley's Comet. In 1066, William the Conqueror invaded England and defeated Harold, the Saxon king, at the Battle of Hastings. William, who won, considered the Comet to be good luck. Harold, who lost, didn't. Naturally, William was so thrilled with the comet that he had his wife Matilda include a picture of it in the famous Bayou Tapestry, which was embroidered as a huge illustration of his victory. Now, in 1222, Genghis Khan and his Mongol hordes swept through southern Europe massacring millions of people. Blame it on Halley's Comet. Oh, I tell you, that poor old comet always took the rap. Sometimes, though, it wasn't seen in such a bad light at all. In fact, some scholars believe that the star of Bethlehem, which guided the wise men to the little manger where Jesus was born, was that very same Halley's Comet. 1835, that was a pretty good year for the comet. One of America's greatest writers, Mark Twain, was born. And here is an interesting coincidence. When Halley's Comet returned again in 1910, 75 years later, Mark Twain lay dying. And he gleefully remarked, the comet and I are two unaccountable freaks. We came in together and we must go out together. Oh, I am looking forward to that. On April 20th, 1910, the day after perihelion, Mark Twain got his dying wish. While Halley's Comet has earned a special place in our history, 
It is only one of numberless comets. It was Edmund Halley's earliest studies of other comets that prepared him for the great discoveries he would make when the comet that bears his name appeared in 1682. Halley's enormous gift to us was his ability to use Newton's mathematical genius to predict the return of the comet. His discoveries gave us a dependable messenger from outer space that will continue to fascinate and teach us. And so it will be for a very long time. Hello, Halley's Comet. So long, Halley's Comet. Oh, and thank you for the new information. And please come back, Halley's Comet. About 75 years from now? Okay, it's a date. Things that you do just once in your lifetime 